I V M. Have you ever wondered why women don't do more crime? Well, we're here to tell you. There's misconduct all the time. Women are thieves and murderers. That's gross misconduct. Con artists, money launderers. Mm. Criminal misconduct. Financial fraud that's hard to track. Takes some planning, but still misconduct. Even breaching a contract. Well, that's more civil, though. It's misconduct. Misconduct. We tell you all about women that suck. Things that make you say, "What the?" It's misconduct. Hello, 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 and welcome to Misconduct. We're a podcast about Indian women that are also criminals. My name is Raghavi, and I am Nisha. And on today's episode, we are going to talk about Madhuri Gupta. So, who's Madhuri Gupta? She was a junior diplomat with the Indian High Commission in Islamabad, Pakistan, who was arrested in 2010 for allegedly violating several provisions of the Official Secrets Act, 1923. The Official Secrets Act. From now on, we shall be referring to it as OSA. Among other things, uh, it penalizes espionage. So, what did Madhuri supposedly do? She fell in love with a young officer of the ISI, which is the Inter Services Intelligence, the premier intelligence agency of Pakistan. She then proceeded to pass on classified documents to him about India's foreign relations and internal matters. There are many, many. many rumors about her intentions and motives and it's all over the news uh one of the motives which was talked about was that she was unhappy with her promotions and her service conditions but it was most likely that she was dot 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 seduced by a pakistani agent yes <laughs> <laughs> Uh she was sentenced to 3 years in jail for passing on sensitive information to Pakistan's ISI So this is the story of Madhuri Gupta who is now branded a traitor to India. Yikes. Uh actually do you want to hear something stupid I did while I was writing this episode? I always want to hear what stupid thing you did. Yeah, you really you really trip on me for no reason dude. Um <laughs> uh, so her name is Madhuri Gupta, right? Mm. So I'm reading like I've been I was reading for almost a week before I was like okay let's sit down and like actually write this episode there's too much nonsense there. Mm-hmm. And the thing is at some point I don't know when that really happened I stopped writing the word the phrase madhuri gupta and it just became madhuri dikshit <laughs> i was expecting that <laughs> <laughs> shut up okay it's not like it was in- it just happened i don't even know when it happened and i'm reading stuff i even copy pasted things like quotes and it says gupta mm. but then later i would say dikshit made no sense okay and then i found out what i did i was like wow that is beyond stupid and i did control f replace uh. except i only replaced the word madhuri Oh, instead course. of Madhuri Dikshit, <laughs> and I replaced Madhuri with Madhuri Gupta. So it be, so everywhere it became Madhuri Gupta Dikshit. <laughs> this is Wait. it was a nightmare writing this episode, man. Why didn't you replace Dikshit with Gupta? That is a great question. <laughs> uh, anyway, before we start off, a quick disclaimer: this podcast literally has the words "true crime" on the artwork. So yes, it is very likely that we will discuss <laughs> themes that are possibly violent or gory. Definitely criminal in nature. Uh, this podcast is not suitable for children. Viewer discretion is advised. Viewer, listener, listener discretion is advised. <laughs> Unless the whole time they're staring at the artwork. I mean, it's beautiful. It is. It so is why beautiful. not? Shout out to our friend Shruti. Yes, got the artwork through. <laughs> She was brilliant. Cool. So before we really get into Madhuri, let's go over some basic concepts, such as what is a honey pot. So honey potting is a very old espionage technique. Essentially, you develop a, a sexual or romantic relationship with someone who you know has access to some information that is probably useful to you. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be for political gain or to get state secrets or just to have some leverage over something so, or so over someone through like blackmail or extortion. Right. A more fun name. that we came across for this is sex spionage <laughs> but i prefer the word honey pot i think it just sounds like it just sounds more ado- like it's just very uh, you won't really realize what it's about you would think it's like something you do to like attract winnie the pooh or something <laughs> you know like a pot of honey nobody really like it. when i first heard the name i didn't think this is what it was but then when you say sex spionage mm. it's like i mean it's pretty obvious it's yes. just the two words <laughs> put together the concept is 
so common in modern espionage. For example, in 1975, a former assistant FBI director, William C. Sullivan, tested before the United States Senate, saying that honeypotting is just a thing that agents casually use. He said, the use of sex is a common practice among intelligence services all over the world. This is a tough, dirty business. We have used that technique against the Soviets. They have used it against us. Hmm. So it's just, it's very common. So some honeypotting schemes apparently take, could even take like years. Like the person has to lay the traps, spend years getting to know them, establishing right. a relationship. And I, I don't know, I guess they, like agents are trained for things like this. So they probably yeah. be very, very good at playing the part. Like you won't know that you're being sex <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> So, a very popular example of honeypotting was conducted between East and West Germany before they were unified. It was mm -hmm. called the Stasi technique. It was common for East Germany forces to have like young, handsome male officers. Mm -hmm. And they would pretend to be from West Germany and would meet West German women posted at the embassies and woo them and get confidential information. And West Germany was not stupid though. And they would just plant <laughs> their own honeypot. <laughs> Can you... <laughs> So can you imagine if the, like if if West and East Germany were both planting honey pots at the same time, yeah. and there were two spies from East and West Germany, <laughs> and they just met each other, thinking they're honey pot, like they're basically honey potting each other. Okay, yes. and it would be, be so stupid. They'd be on the phone, <laughs> and they'd be like, "No, you tell first. No, you tell. No, you you tell me first. And all and all the while, the East and West German. The intelligence forces are listening on the conversation, okay? And they're like, hey, somebody just say <laughs> it already. Terrible. <laughs> oh, that would be hilarious, though. That's true. <laughs> Another very popular use of honeypotting was used by the Nazis, uh, where they used a brothel called Salon Kitty, where women were trained to seduce German dignitaries, foreign agents, mm -hmm. and diplomats. Actually, the story about uh, Salon Kitty is quite interesting so yeah. I invite everyone to look it up whenever you have the time mm -hmm. more recently you might have heard of honey potting in some many many fictional accounts and the most <laughs> famous one being taking James Bond of course man <laughs> dude I don't even understand how he's still a spy okay the, the number of times he's been seduced by some rando woman like at this point he just should he should he should have his badge taken away his gun he whatever whatever should. they give spies it's just so stupid that one cool car that transforms into everything yeah take it everything. away everything it also here also whiskey whiskey with <laughs> the ice still like there it's whatever bad I just <laughs> Bond movies annoy me so much so I have seen one Bond movie what in my Which entire one? life I uh, I think it was Die Another Day. Hey, that's not bad. Hey, Pierce Thanks. Brosnan. That's oh, fine. So hot. That's good. <laughs> but, you know what I've seen many of? Mm -hmm. Marvel movies. And like Black <laughs> Widow from the Marvel movies is introduced in Iron Man 2 as kind of a honeypot, I guess. Oh. But like she doesn't stick with it. She becomes a good guy. But uh, yeah, honeypotting is hella common. That's true. I didn't think about it that way. Um, you know, I have been trapped by <laughs> honeypotting. As a child. As a child? Okay, uh, so there was this dude in my kindergarten class. His name was Nikhil. Is, I'm sure he's still alive. His name is Nikhil Patel, okay? And he was, um, we used to call him, like he used to bring papads to school every day. That was just his thing, okay? I know this dude. You've told me about the papad guy. This is I've told you about it. Yeah. But the thing is, sometimes he also used to sit next to me and then just like talk to me. He's just, he's just a nice dude sometimes. He's like very chubby, hmm. very fair, chubby, like maida, okay? Like a big ball <laughs> of maida. And he would just sit next to me and talk to me and be sweet. And then he would just ask for my juice and I would give it. <gasps> oh my God. Yeah. Honey potted at the age of... I don't know what, three? Five? Sure. Five. <laughs> Yours is worse. Three, it seems. Um, but yeah, Nikhil. Nikhil Patel. Nikhil Papad Patel. If you're out there, you went, and if you went to Aron English High School in Dubai. <laughs> yes. Um, kindergarten one and two, section P. Please reach out to me. <laughs> I'm okay with being Harry Potter as an adult as well. <laughs> but sorry, let's just sort of get into, this is like a huge deviation for no reason. Yes. The Official Secrets Act of hmm. 1923 or OSA, which is, we don't have to call it that. It's quite. No, it is the OSA. The OSA. What is the OSA, guys? The OSA is India's 
primary national law which governs all matters of secrecy and confidentiality uh, where it relates to the country's governance what does that mean basically it means that the government thinks something is secret and it should not be revealed to the public for whatever reason then revealing it to the public effectively becomes an offense hmm. and this is in like there are many scenarios for this um hmm. but essentially the law sort of allows the government to withhold some information from citizens as well so even if you think about filing an application under the right to information act the rti act Mm-hmm. Think again, because there are exemptions under the RTI oh. Act just for this. Um, it, more recently, in two thousand nineteen, the Supreme Court said that the RTI provisions do supersede the OSA, but it's in mm. a very, very limited context. It doesn't just generally apply to any sort of. Uh, so you can't just go up to the government and be like, "Hey, give me all of your defense plans <laughs> for the next several years," and they'll just be like, "Yeah, okay, take it here." <laughs> that's not going to happen. It's not going to. That's just not going to work. So the Act does apply to all citizens of India. but more importantly it applies to government servants and mm. the reason for that is because who is most likely to have access to official secrets government officials of course and there's there's a huge legislative history for this act of course because it's so restrictive it has its roots in the mm. british colonial era the original law was passed in 1904 um and the purpose of the original act was to prevent uh, a lot of nationalist newspapers from mm. the independence free like struggle era mm. uh, to prevent these newspapers from printing something derogatory about the british colonialists right mm. it made sense in that context because the british were not particularly subtle about suppressing political uprisings no they were not <laughs> they were not um so yeah in 1947 when we did get independent we had the ability to do away with the law but we mm. were like Nah, let's <laughs> keep it. <laughs> let's keep this law. So very quickly, just so you have an idea of what this law covers hmm. before we really get into Madhuri's sitch. Hmm. The act doesn't really define what the word official secrets means, but it prohibits okay. certain actions, okay? And for the sake of today's episodes, I'll tell you what's like super important for you. Hmm. The first thing it prohibits, spying. obviously hmm. so spying is actions like going to a prohibited place or passing on information that can be useful to your country's enemies um communicating some sort of an official password or a code just a bunch of hmm. things that can hmm. be harmful to india's sovereignty and integrity and security okay the most important thing is you don't have to really even show that the person was actually guilty of it hmm. it's usually enough that the circumstances of their conduct sort of exhibited hmm. that it was hmm. harmful to the state um and because the nature of spying can really vary the jail time is between 3 years and 14 years if you are convicted okay okay so don't be shady yeah basically don't don't be shady seems about right <laughs> fair that <laughs> really summarizes all of o- osa actually <laughs> um so number 2 thing that you should remember is you can't talk to foreign agents okay this is basically the same as spying except once you know that stuff you just also tell someone <laughs> and that someone mm. is is supposed to not I mean, if they're not an indian or they're working for a foreign state um mm. in those scenarios obviously you can't release that information um mm. again the information that you pass on should be useful to the enemy of a country like you just go to some foreigner and you're like hey i don't know you can't say random <laughs> shit like that i don't know man you can't say random nonsense like it doesn't make any sense there'll be something that's useful for the enemy of a country you know okay it's not really useful to them right so if you go and tell someone vada pav is the best in mumbai it's fine <laughs> i mean if you go and tell them this is where you have to uh, enter for uh, taj hotel if you want to do it sneakily then it's a problem yes that's uh, oh my god this this is in a really dark place uh but yes the third and the more dumb one the dumbest of the rules is wrongful communication of information hmm. now why do i say it's dumb Of course, it covers some things like access to official information, uh, where you were like careless enough that you give it off to somebody. But it also covers scenario where, like, if you were just sitting in a coffee shop and you just leave some like confidential information around and somebody picks it up, then what you have done is committed the crime of being stupid, and the crime of being stupid comes with jail time of about three years. Oh my God! But you know what? I agree. This, if you're stupid, you should go to jail for three years. I mean, fair. I totally. I kind of also agree with that. <laughs> cool. So, and that's pretty much what the OSA is all about. Is it a colonial hangover? Yes. Is it in place to protect the state? Yes. Is it supposed to be a deterrent for government agents that might think of screwing over the country? Mm. Yes. Is it possible to hide behind this act to prevent otherwise public information from being easily available? The answer will surprise you. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Have there been multiple efforts to review this act and see if it's even applicable in the current political context? Mm. Surprisingly, yes. <laughs> So it's yes to all of these things because no law is perfect. Uh, but this is a law and that's the law that Madhuri Gupta was penalized under. Mm-hmm. And have other people been caught under for these offenses? Yes, so many. Sources mm-hmm. say that since 2014, there have been like 50 arrests under the Official Secrets Act. Mm-hmm. One of the most recent cases was decided in uh, 2019 when a guy named... A, guy, a person named uh, Asif Hussain from Kolkata was identified mm-hmm. as a Pakistan national who was communicating sensitive information regarding the Indian army. He received Yikes. nine years jail time under the OSA. Wow. All right. Yeah. Um, on that note, let's take a really quick break for you to like go and digest all this information. If you want to quickly Google the OSA, go for it. Um, it you're not going to be able to interpret it in the next like two <laughs> minutes. Uh, and after the break, we'll talk about who the woman was. What did she do? What was her vibe, guys? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Zarina Punawala, host of the Empowering Series podcast on the IVM Network. I happen to be a peak performance coach and leadership coach by profession. And I'm here to share with you productivity tools, life-altering techniques, and real life hacks to help you achieve your maximum potential in everything you do, your relationships, professions, careers. So tune in every Monday to unleash your inner power. Be safe, be well, be empowered. Welcome back after the break. We are talking about Madhuri Gupta, the branded traitor of India. So who was this woman? Madhuri Gupta, we don't know. That's, that's, <laughs> like, that's, we have no idea who she is. There is no information. There are so many articles that talk about her, but nothing that actually says anything about her early life. Right. But here's what we do know. Madhuri was a member of the Indian Foreign Services. Mm-hmm. Hey, she might have known Zoya Khan if Zoya Khan was Khan? not a scam. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Zoya is not even... I don't think she would have gone to any of the same like, you know, training institutes and stuff. Yeah, of course not. For more information on Zoya Khan, please refer to episode 3. <laughs> ah, it's, it's, it's a crossover episode. <laughs> Um, so Madhuri Gupta, she was in Group B, which is not hired through the UPSC civil services exam. Group B enrollment has a separate, like uh, less competitive entrance this exam. Is, so this is still the IFS, right? The yeah, Indian yeah. Foreign service, right? For okay. the Indian Foreign Service. Uh, so if you get through, you start at a lower position than Group A, uh, mm-hmm. because those are the guys who cleared the UPSC exam, which is hectic as hell. Of course. <laughs> And this is generally a bit like hush-hush, but Group A and B members are involved in quite a bit of rivalry. Mm -hmm. Group B members can still be promoted to Group A over time, but there are allegations of discrimination against the Group B members. And Group A members are usually preferred for promotions, even with less experience. Right. Just because Mm -hmm. of the uh, exam that they've cleared and the position that they hold. Remember this though, because it becomes very important later on. Mm -hmm. So... We know that she was appointed as the second secretary at the Indian High Commission in Islamabad. She Mm -hmm. was working in press and communications wing of the High Commission. At this point of time, I would like to say, (laughs) same (laughs) Z's. The moment I read this part, I'm like, hey, I like this girl. (laughs) It me. (laughs) Um, So working in press and communications essentially made her like a a liaison officer between the High Mm -hmm. Commission and all of the other embassies. So many, many newspapers tell us that that in 2010, at 52 years old, she was a spinster. (gasps) Shut up. That is the biggest crime of all. Lock her up. Lock her up, I say. (laughs) Well, Madhuri was also in service for almost 30 years. She had worked in embassies and consulates in Kuala Lumpur, Croatia and Pakistan, including administrative roles in Delhi as well. Mm -hmm. She also appears to have been fluent in Urdu, which is a good reason to send her to Pakistan. Yeah, fair. Yeah. Urdu is a beautiful language though. Mm -hmm. There is one account by uh, Lamat R. Hassan, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing the name wrong, who claims that she knew Madhuri. She says, Mm -hmm. apparently Madhuri was really into fashion and living an organic lifestyle. (laughs) She was kind of... uh, 
you know joyful in a way she would just like freely hand out her visiting cards to people in pakistan what? which is definitely not advisable but i feel like she's one of those people who's just like ah, kya hoga yeah. you know i know what you mean i get yeah. it yeah so um she also learned urdu just to get that posting in pakistan she hired a tutor for 2 years to achieve that fluency so wow okay so it's not like she didn't have any ambitions or talents or goals you know yeah. like she was like a pretty well rounded person i mean if you learning urdu so fluently within 2 years to mm. be able to get a posting in pakistan is like yeah. a pretty great deal so i guess it's just the stuff after that mm. stuff that happened after that that sort of muddled her talents and yep. her ambitions i guess so what did she do guys um so we found out in a- that in april 2010 madhuri had been arrested for passing on some secret and sensitive information to certain pakistani intelligence agents hmm. so she was approached by the isi which as you mentioned earlier is the intelligence wing of the pakistan army i think two of their handlers basically came to her in the year 2008 um, hmm. the names were mubashir rana and jamshed Uh, she called Jamshed Jim, which indicated that she may have been a little close to him in some way. Uh, so they gave her a SIM card and a mobile phone. Using mm. this, she set up a personal email account, and okay. um, she would use this account to send information to them. So uh, she apparently, like, also met them many times in safe houses oh. in Islamabad. Mm. Um, so she was frequently in contact with them, pretty mm. much since two thousand eight till her arrest. and what sort of secret and sensitive information are we talking about here one may ask hmm. uh I, there's a lot guys there's a lot of stuff that she used to she, she would tell these people um one of a, a very useful document that really helped us sort of put together all of these charges uh was a decision by the delhi high court in 2016 uh hmm. which revised the charges that the prosecution had originally filed against her we'll get into that a little later um but this this uh, court order tells us what the prosecution said was in her received and sent email hmm, folders hmm. so this is the stuff that she had in there okay what she forwarded many documents that relate to terrorism in kashmir to these guys two okay some of the documents included major developments in pakistan and india's external relations we don't have elaborations on this hmm. but this is what is stated Three and some. This is something a little more specific. There were documents about hydroelectric power plants that were being set up in Kashmir. Oh my! Yeah. Four. She apparently attached documents that had discussions and activities, um, meetings that were attended by the officials of the Indian High Commission in Islamabad. Hmm. Hmm. This is a little funny in a way, but in March 2010. Madhuri had apparently sent a list of phone numbers of officials in the High Commission, and this list oh was classified God. for official use only. So I can only imagine some dude. Imagine if this leaked to a bunch of telemarketers; it would just be so <laughs> stupid. <laughs> Sitting in the High Commission, you get a call, and they are like, "Sir, I can give you a loan." Sir, credit card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, Raghavi Ramesh. <laughs> Usually, how oh, they go? Was told. Was <laughs> so stupid. Um, oh, there's more things. Uh, number six. She forwarded information regarding India's diplomatic relations with Afghanistan, and also mm. apparently some talks that India was having with certain terrorist organizations. Ooh. Whoa. Um, she also forwarded details about the High Commission's security detail, including those of, I mean, diplomats, obviously, uh, some Indian armed forces and their family members. Oh my God. Do literally that's... all that's missing in this list is my own mother's maiden name. <laughs> that's the only thing that's missing in this. It's this is a ridiculously elaborate list of stuff you should just know you're not supposed to send out to anybody. Yeah. yeah. But the prosecution obviously had a very good case to say that this is extremely prejudicial to the of safety course. and security and interest of mm. uh, India. Um, they also argued that revealing a lot of the information was very detrimental to India's interest yeah. in the international stage. So that's really what the prosecution's overall arguments were, um, mm. and you would find that it fits very neatly into what the OSA says that you should not be doing. <laughs> Um, she also sent one hilariously ridiculous email on uh, 22nd oh, yeah. December 2009 <laughs> so in this email she said that the deputy high commissioner's wife hates pakistan and all <laughs> pakistanis and expects all india based people to have the same attitude <laughs> now now in itself this is derogatory and stupid for the wife of a diplomat to say yeah but more importantly the wife of this diplomat is in pakistan <laughs> the country that she spoke about so harshly and like a country that historically i don't know if you know this guys we've had turbulent relationships with them what we so, have turbulent relationships with pakistan this is the first i'm hearing of this so 
the prosecution said that by revealing this information madhuri had effectively endangered the safety of a senior indian diplomat stationed abroad mm. in a country with adversarial relations with india yeah which is so valid like she has to be careful i mean obviously I, at this point you can start to see that uh, she's not doing this like for time pass she's really right? not it's a pretty like elaborate process yeah. oh, also um now since we're on the note of her sending stuff through uh, mm. email uh, there's an indian express article that tells us that she created mm. a personal email account to forward these documents right and the email account was madsmiles <laughs> at gmail.com terrible yeah man she's a 52 year old woman just come on buddy just madhuri dot gupta Forty <laughs> four or something. I'm sure there are other Madhuri Guptas that have Gmail accounts before you. <laughs> But Matt smiles oh. is actually this must have been a, a recommendation by Gmail. Oh no! <laughs> worst. That's the worst. Um. So yeah, sorry. Go ahead. This is what I wanted to really interrupt to tell you. It's just too funny. <laughs> We've also seen statements from major political players regarding her. One of them mm-hmm. was. by union minister kapil sibal in which mm-hmm. he kind of vaguely job shames her uh he says i'm not trying to discriminate on the basis of class but a person who has not been properly trained and brought up in the values of the services can perhaps be more susceptible to foreign inducements easily nevertheless given the fact that all those working in islamabad know that they are under watch and being targeted by pakistani intelligence which is on the lookout for chinks that they were able to penetrate the embassy is shocking hmm. so this pisses me off on like multiple levels because it's a very pr thing to do people in comms are the ones who have way too much information and they know that it is their job integrity to not be like talking about all of this stuff of outside right yeah. and it so happens that the people who are usually at the bottom the ones that are not considered at all So for someone to say, "Oh, it's so shocking." Well, you probably sent like all of the documents to the guys right at the bottom and said, "Take a printout yeah. and give it to me before my meeting." <laughs> and like the person who's taking a printout is definitely going to take a look, or like course, you sent yeah. it to their email address. You are not inviting them into the meeting. What else are they going to do? They're going to read through the document. That's true. And the ones at the bottom will have that much information. They're doing all of the groundwork. It just makes sense. Yeah. And I think this is why, like, just treat them with more respect, man. Hmm. If you do that, they will take their job more seriously. Right. Yeah. The jobs that I have worked and I have had like lists of like like all of the top people in Bangalore, mm-hmm. all of their information in one Excel sheet, and it was literally forwarded to me to my Gmail ID to Whoa. take printouts of. The only reason, I mean, of course, I have my own integrity, but like, if my job had treated me like shit, of course, <laughs> at some yeah, point yeah. of time, out of problem, like here, you also take. You call telemarketer. Sell credit card. It's like how employers say, "Oh, I'm so shocked that people are leaving my company. Why mm. is that? Why is the attrition rate so high? Because you treat them like trash. Yeah. If they leave, you're they're like you're, you're like, what do you want? And they say money, and you say no. Say okay, I want like a real like balance between my work and personal life, and they say no. They say I want to have a baby and leave, and they're like no. This is literally <laughs> nothing that you give them. It just totally makes sense that they would get pissed off. Can I get what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So further. Initial reports at the time of her arrest said that she was in the information wing of the High Commission and not the political wing. Hmm. Mr. K. C. Singh, a former secretary with the Ministry of External Affairs, said in 2010 that she could not have been privy to sensitive documents. I don't agree with this, but yeah, that's I get it. We just discussed that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, but he did agree that this this entire uh, case it was a penetration. He also okay. very casually said. We earlier had a penetration by East Europe, but this is a first from Pakistan. What? <laughs> this this is an actual statement that this guy made. Yes, he just yes. He, he just, just casually, casually announced yeah. that before this 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 current breach. Yes, we've already had a penetration, which is an yes. odd choice of words, but sure, <laughs> penetration by East Europe. Yeah. Just casually. Who casually just announces something like that? It's a it's a freaking breach into our security, like a. Country security system. Who's so casual about it, man? Yep. So uh, many senior mm-hmm. officials admit the revelation had caused a major embarrassment. Um, mm-hmm. No shit, Sherlock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, by the way, uh, so this arrest. Uh, I mean, obviously, she got arrested hmm. for this in April 2010, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and 
just a little after uh, this was supposed to be a major south asian conference of country leaders for the sarc uh, and it was supposed to take place in bhutan mm. so this news goes public it's a complete national embarrassment of that india had to go to this you know like this stage oh, where they were supposed oh, to be like a, a superpower of sorts within sarc so the embarrassment was like 200x okay it was just cringe all around and i'm sure nobody in the government was like happy about this at mm. all yeah there is also one other particularly funny observation by the indian express uh, mm-hmm. this was from an article in april 2010 Mm-hmm. So back when the press kind of knew about her but she was like still in custody so there was not mm-hmm. enough information out there uh, for the journalist to get like truly excited mm-hmm. so the indian express some intern must have decided for the heck of it let's just dig into her facebook account and see what's there <laughs> on okay. her facebook account <laughs> they made two major observations okay. one she had friends in india that she was in touch with okay mm-hmm. number two that's Here are some of the Facebook pages that she was following. Oh no. CNN International. 2. I need more sleep. And 3. Gol Gappe. Are you see? <laughs> I would actually I I was likely probably also following I need more sleep. I was probably following Gol Gappe. Hey. Yeah, that sounds Hey, she's so relatable, man. Um on that note, um I would recommend we take a really tiny break. while i go uh get some gold cuppy for myself actually <laughs> uh, i am quite hungry i'm going to get a snack uh but yes guys we will see you on the other side of the break um we will discuss motives what is the fun part of of this podcast so we'll see you right after hey it's been another great week on the ivm podcast network on the edges of just cricket podcast in the first half ashwin is joined by varun to wrap india's odi tour of sri lanka in the second half dj joins the party to discuss the first t20 international between india and sri lanka if you'd like to hear more about this match former indian cricketer sabha kareem joins rajiv mishra and khel niti and they talk some more about it Ladies and gentlemen, we're really excited to announce a new show, a show about crypto with Rohan Joshi. He's going to dive deep and demystify all the crypto stuff that we've been hearing about. And let me tell you a little bit more about stuff that's going on on the network really quickly. Congratulations to Maru Kinai who celebrates 50 episodes of The Note with a discussion on health as a fundamental right. On Pesa Vesa, Anupam talks to Harsha Chetanwala of mywealthcrow.com. Sarina Punawala is starting a new mini series on emotional intelligence. Do check out the kickoff episode on the empowering series and simplified talks about semiconductors. Do follow us on social media where IVM podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. And remember if you're enjoying this show or any other show for that matter, please do tell a friend that's really helpful for us. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors on the network this week. They make this all possible. Thank you very much, Seed, Cred, Global Victoria, Bank of Baroda, Intuit India, Lenovo and CoinSwitch Kuber. We really appreciate your support. Welcome back from the break everyone. So, we're going to get right into it. Why did Madhuri Gupta do what she did? So, there is an April 2010 article by the Indian mm. Express uh where it sort of essentially Madhuri is confessing to her crimes, okay? So, she's mm. saying that uh, this is this is when she was still being interrogated by uh, the Delhi police raw everybody anybody yeah. who had any interest in her was like, "Hey, come let's quickly talk to her." Um so she said that she was disgruntled with her job. and that she wanted to teach all the arrogant IFS officers a lesson she also said that she passed on the information to the pakistani officers without any monetary gain so mm. she admits it she passed on the information yeah but she said it was purely because she was just pissed off and she didn't really like want to make any money off of it mm. and there are a couple of events that happened uh, that sort of led to this apparently sometime in 2008 Hmm. she was chastised in public by a senior um, ifs officer for failing to complete certain tasks and yeah, i mean come on man like she's a human person i'm sure she has some pride it just is normal i guess yeah not that it justifies anything but i would understand why she would be pissed off about it hmm. let's also remember like nisha mentioned earlier she was a group b officer hmm. um, and the rivalry between group a and group b officers is already pretty well documented so it's very likely that she just sort of felt belittled Mm, um maybe mm. even underutilized in a way at the high commission and she was pretty set on doing this that much was very clear because after she was arrested apparently she said to one of the security officers that was holding her she said what took you so long to get me wow <laughs> yeah just outright like so she was just like i was going to do this in any case why are you so bad at your job <laughs> mm, wow your audacity yeah. She, yeah that's true um she also actually denied having any person relationship with her two isi handlers uh, mm. mubashir and jim mm-hmm. so 
The official story, of course, so far is that she was a pissed off employee. And then comes July 2010 when mm. her charge sheet was officially filed. This was a 700 page charge sheet, yeah. by the way, because that's just how like a mountain of evidence that they had. Mm -hmm. uh, they also had like 30 witnesses lined up to testify. <laughs> that's not in the charge sheet. Uh, something unusual came up. Mm -hmm. It turns out that Madhuri was having an affair with Jim <laughs> and yeah. they wanted to get married. Sure. Mm. <laughs> So the charge sheet that was filed uh, indicated that Madhuri was essentially a victim of a honeypot mm -hmm. that didn't excuse her crimes. But I guess it gives us an understanding that she was likely in a vulnerable position, which is starkly different from the position that she herself took earlier in the year when she was right. confessing. Contents of the email between Madhuri and Jim showed that she was quite taken by him. Mm. Um, the authorities also managed to procure letters written to Jim in which uh, Madhuri's intimacy with him was kind of established. Right. She refers to herself by the name Javeria in her letters. Mm. Okay. <laughs> in one such letter though, and this is kind of sad, Madhuri had written, I have done my best for him and for his sake, but he treats me like a dog. He has no consideration for me, nor does he make any effort to understand my position. Till we are married, until I am in the present job, I have to behave accordingly. But Jim has strong objections to my socializing with any Pakistani. I'm not used to sitting at home in Parta. Oh man. Yeah. That is, that is heartbreaking. It is. I mean, obviously it wasn't a healthy relationship. No. Not no, that not at all. any relationship with someone who's committing treason <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, your handler from the opposing intelligence organization. Yeah. Actively trying to honeypot you. <laughs> yes. Uh, I feel like in general, that relationship between these two people might not be healthy. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. But she was clearly so into him. Yeah. And she seems so upset about like how the relationship is going. Kind of feel it. But you know what? Girl, don't shed tears over a man. You messed up. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, yeah, she did mess up. But like, I just feel bad for her, man. Like, you know, like, I mean, uh, you remember we've read a lot of these these reports where it's they really really focus on how single she was which is so sad we'll get into it a little bit later mm. but it's you know it's just stuff yeah. like that that just really is genuinely upsetting um but yeah it's just heartbreaking the story is just genuinely sad she was also apparently paid an amount of one lakh rupees by the isi handlers and this is just mm. like some unnaturally small amount for someone who's basically selling state secrets right. it's not like she can use this money to retire from her job or something <laughs> yeah. if she did take or like if she did take this money we can say with certainty that she has no idea how to bargain <laughs> <laughs> she would have gone to them and she'd be like Jim I want two crores for this Jim would be like we can give you one lakh and she was like okay I love you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's that's just so sad I mean that also falls into the honey potting right mm. even if even if like the payment would be just nothing because the real treat is that she probably was genuinely in love with him. Like that's what she was getting out of it. So it's quite sad. So Madhuri's lawyers, mm -hmm. uh, they would go on to accept that it was a honeypot, but mm -hmm. they would essentially frame it as her being a victim to it, effectively sort of taking her agency away by virtue yeah. of that defense, you know. Mm -hmm. They consistently maintained that she was innocent, but still mm -hmm. agreed that she was entrapped. Mm -hmm. And the lawyers actually ended up painting this picture of this sad, lonely, older woman who was looking oh, for love. Man. And that's really sad. But the fact is, despite whatever the scenario was, it doesn't really even matter, you know, that she felt that she was tricked or whatever mm. it was. The fact is the evidence against her yeah. for the actual acts that she did was so incredibly overwhelming. The stuff that we listed out mm. that were in the uh, Delhi or, uh, High Court order, the list of stuff that mm. she passed is all actual things that were they found it in the servers and stuff, you know, in yeah. her emails. It's not stupid. Like, essentially what happened was, this, this is what the police recovered, okay? They recovered five laptops. Uh, this, aside Whoa. from her phone and SIM, of course. Hmm. Five laptops, 42 CDs, 21 Whoa. floppies from her residence. You remember floppies? <laughs> I do remember yeah. floppies. floppies is... Six MB will fit in it. <laughs> yeah. One extremely pixelated photo of Rithik Roshan <laughs> is what I used to have <laughs> for floppy. So yeah, so like, that's how much stuff, like they recovered all of these and they found so much in there. She, the, her, the Blackberry phone uh, that mm. she had gotten from Jim had 
uh, 25 emails at least back and forth between just her and Jim. This is not even just oh yeah. This is not even just stuff about like what she was giving to them. This is just conversations mm. that she was mm. having with Jim. So there was so much evidence that the motive barely matters. It doesn't matter that she must have been tricked because the law is not even framed that way. The law just is: Did you yeah. pass this on? You did. Well, now you're screwed. Yeah, yeah. So I guess so. Uh, don't be shady. <laughs> Don't be shady. That seems like a very uh, general pro-life tip. Yes. Is do not be shady. Uh, but you must be asking now. Uh, she did get caught. Yes, we know this. But did she have her day in court? Yes, of course. <laughs> so, as you mentioned earlier, at the age of 52, Madhuri was detained by a special police wing around April 2010. Hmm. So, the thing is, they had actually been tracking her for almost a year before that. Raw oh. uh, hmm. research hmm. and analysis wing yeah. um, was tracking her both in Islamabad and her uh, her house in New Delhi. Oh. So obviously they were doing this because they wanted to gain enough evidence to actually nab her. Hmm. But I can't help but wonder, between that year of her getting tracked, how much information was she passing on to these guys? <laughs> I mean, the smart thing to do would be to feed her wrong information. So they were giving him, like you know, Jim, wrong information. Oh, But yeah. I don't know if they did that. I actually have no idea. Um, but there's not one thing that Raw did that was genuinely smart. They mm. brought her back to India from Islamabad mm. um, in April 2010, saying that she was needed for some work with the SAR uh, conference oh. that we spoke about earlier, the one that oh, was happening yeah. in Bhutan. Mm. So they brought her back to India, mm. and then when they brought her in, Raw was like, "Psych." <laughs> and then they just <laughs> then they just detained her. <laughs> Aha, bamboozled, <laughs> bamboozled. So yeah, so she was detained, um, and she was questioned by everyone from Raw to the Intelligence Bureau, the Delhi Police, just anybody who was like, "I would like to speak with her, please." They were like, "Sure, go ahead." <laughs> and eventually, I mean, she was detained for a long time, but mm. finally, she was arrested on twenty second April two thousand ten. What were her charges? Initially, she was charged under sections three, four, and five of the Official Secrets Act. Mm. Um, these are three provisions that I very condescendingly explained to you <laughs> earlier in this episode. Um, she was also charged under the Indian Penal Code for criminal conspiracy. Oh. Mm. Um, at first, the prosecutors charged her under a part of the as in a provision of the OSA that would mm -hmm. only give her three years in prison. Mm. They revised that petition, oh. uh, saying that she actually deserved. The fourteen full years that that mm. that particular punishment provides for, mm. the Delhi High Court allowed it. They said, "Yeah, her charges should be changed because what mm. she did, mm. prima facie, looks like something that would invite this particular uh, charge." Right. What was really surprising is that she was never charged under either the National Security Act or for sedition. Huh. I'm very surprised by that because that's something we just very casually throw around nowadays. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean. It's surprising that she wasn't charged with sedition at all. Maybe because mm. what she did, like evidence-wise, spying just seemed like the best way to do it. I guess those are the charges that would stick. I guess. Yeah. yeah. So in January 2012, Madhuri was granted bail after 21 months uh, in being in prison, mm. and she maintained throughout her trial that she was innocent and that her actions did not meet the charges that were filed against her. Mm. In May 2019, she was convicted under both the OSA. and the mm -hmm. ipc mm -hmm. the additional sessions judge said the conduct of the accused in passing on sensitive secret information in light of the documents proved on record and evidence led by the prosecution categorically proves the charge mm. the judge also refused to grant any leniency he said undoubtedly from a person of her stature it was expected that she would act in a more responsible manner than an ordinary citizen as she was at a high position of trust but her actions tarnished the image of the country and has caused severe threat to the security of the country therefore she does not deserve any leniency in punishment hmm. and i agree with the judge i agree yeah. however she gets only 3 years instead <laughs> of the 14 years that the prosecutors asked for congratulations i guess <laughs> good for her um there's also something very interesting that i came across Uh, in an article which quoted mm. a former special director of India's intelligence bureau mm. um this mm. guy also headed raw for some time so mm. he apparently said uh he was this is all we don't have a full name for this because they didn't actually okay. give his name it's just like a source mm. so he says and i quote this 
As a security precaution, we always say that single people shouldn't be posted to such embassies as without a family support network they can get very lonely. And this is uh, interesting to me. Hmm. <laughs> because <laughs> is the presumption that mm-hmm. if you are single then you are incapable of doing your job. I that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, because that's nonsense. It's not like married people you know don't cheat on their spouses or like they are yeah. like some beacons of faithfulness or something <laughs> i mean i don't think it's fair to completely divest her of agency i think all the conversations yeah. around her you know from the court to the charges that were filed mm. everything that you know the papers were saying mm. till the end till she got convicted you know and even her own lawyers mm. like all of, i mean i understand the lawyers they wanted to play they had to do what they had to do to get her out i understand right. that but essentially it came to a point where she was completely stripped of any sense of like her own independent thought yeah. or agency um and the thing is like as much as she might have been trapped you know by this by jim you know mm. by mm. promises of marriage or whatever it doesn't really change the fact that her actions were that of a consenting adult with a sound yeah. mind that's right it doesn't change anything and the fact that she was taken advantage of doesn't change anything in relation to the fact that she committed treason yes. <laughs> it doesn't change that in fact i think she was quite aware about what she was doing 100% huh you know okay yeah there's one more thing um i'm not sure if you had seen this i there was this interview that times now had conducted um hmm. where they invited her and they were like hey let's i want to talk to you uh, ooh after she got out of jail yes after she got bail uh-huh, so uh-huh. times now was like hey we have this exclusive interview uh, with madhuri gupta we're going to learn everything it's going to be amazing mm. and they hyped and hyped <laughs> and hyped it and then when the actual interview happened she was like yeah jail was hard i guess and then they were like okay tell us more i mean how did this happen what did you do how did you you know like who is jim whatever and she was just like oh so the matter is subjudice and i can't really talk about it and they kept asking okay they were like hey tell us more um, what made you do this uh, why did you move to islamabad all and she's just like matter is subjudice matter is subjudice i can't tell you anything and she trolled the hell out of them because she knows she can't say yeah. anything to these people but she's just like eh i get my face out there it's cool she got her hair nicely done and she went there and she was just like i can't say anything guys sorry but jail was hard <laughs> actually this is something like as you were saying something that's important that you know we should bring up and that that is this is the idea of this podcast right where we're telling people that hey women are not just victims of their circumstances where like women are not just like poor whatever you know like to- thinking of love and and got chose the wrong path no she clearly has agency she knows what she is doing she's selling this country and mm. it's not for love come on like maybe that's one of her motives but there's so many other things as well right, right? so please give her that <laughs> let her be the bad person recognize her for her crimes <laughs> before we wrap up there are two articles that really stuck with me when we were researching this mm-hmm. the first one is an article in the print from 2018 it's titled falling in love with pakistani spy cost madhuri gupta reputation career and 3 years in jail so this article mm-hmm. paints a picture of like a woman that has drifted from her job because of love <laughs> her her love for this gym made her effectively give up her country mm-hmm. and then 4 days later an article in op india ripped apart the article in print and it was titled i think it's op india no i think it's, it's op india <laughs> sorry it ripped apart the print article yeah yeah so it ripped apart the print article because it was titled as shekhar gupta's the print romanticizes treason here is why madhuri gupta is being sent to prison <laughs> Hey, that rhymed also. How cute! <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's basically that one uncle who doesn't understand love marriage, and he's like, "In the love, pull up, love." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. And basically, the article goes on to clarify that this is not a Bollywood movie. She was a consenting adult who chose to throw the country under the bus. Yeah, I mean, fair. Uh, they're not wrong, but the print is also mm. not really wrong. I mean. Surprise surprise people can be two things <laughs> things can be two things i mean the print was slightly romanticizing it but they yeah. went wrong that that's what she fell for and as much as i'm not a fan of op india as much as mm. they are saying this 
they're right she is also a consenting adult and yes, yes this is why she is being sent to prison um so yes it can be two things guys what <laughs> nuance aha <laughs> on that note on the note of nuance mm. let's recap this whole sitch today because we threw so much information at you <laughs> let's have nisha run us through a cute little musical recap just get you up to speed very quickly nisha would you like to take over please gave away my country i spy with my little lie it wasn't for the money cuz i spy i'll tell you why underpaid undermined underestimated all the time Come away, I'll make you pay. Went to jail, but I lived to slay another day. Fell for Jim, that was stupid. I agree, but I spied with my little lie. Betrayed my land, betrayed by a man. When I spied for the ISI. Wow, that was really good job Nisha. Thank you. Girl. That was so beautiful and <laughs> dark and upsetting actually. This whole thing has been quite upsetting. Yeah. She just basically sold the country. Yeah. You she know, did. it's it's like a very twisted Vizara. Oh god. <laughs> Worst. Yeah. Actually, you know what? You should be similar to our Troiloko episode where we didn't have one mention of Devdas. Oh. You should be very proud that we have not mentioned Veer Zara even once this entire That's time. That's true. Very so, cool. yeah, I also have not seen Veer Zara. Okay, that's just <laughs> what I was trying to say is uh we were subverting expectations as what this podcast is about. Subverting expectations till you die, but as long as you're here, I hope you had a great time listening to us. As usual we have episodes out every Wednesday please keep a year out for that and you can get all of our information on the uh, blog that we have you can even catch up with us on Instagram you can find me at just nishful thinking that's just.nishful.thinking and you can catch ragavi at ragi dot dose our uh, instagram handles and our blog are in the description of this episode please go ahead and follow us and uh, if you want to know more about our sources and what we read for this episode you'll find that in the blog as well and we will see you on the next episode of misconduct see you guys we live in an age of disruption of immense change in every aspect of work life and business But is the old way of doing things truly dead? And are we ever going to stop saying the new normal? Join me, Varun Dugirala, on Advertising is Dead every Tuesday as I talk to entrepreneurs, leaders, creators, and change makers from across business, media, marketing, and beyond to dig a little deeper into how we got here, what we're doing now, and where we're headed. You can catch all the episodes of Advertising is Dead on the IBM Podcast website, app, or wherever you get your podcast from. If you love cricket, listen up. The Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast is here for you. Hosted by DJ Varun and me Ashwin, we bring a fun, fresh fans point of view to talking all things cricket. Sometimes it's just the three of us, sometimes we have guests including current and former international cricketers. For new episodes every week, check out The Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast on the IVM app, website or wherever you get your podcasts.